Hello and welcome back to Climate TV brought to you by The Climate Group. I'm Eduardo Gonsalves. Today I'm joined by Neil Dunn, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer at BT Group. Uh, Neil, thanks for talking to us today. Let's talk first of all about RE100. So you're one of the members of this corporate initiative which is committed to switching to 100% renewable energy. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you're doing here in terms of reaching those goals? Sure. Well, look, I think RE100 is one of the simplest things that businesses and organisations can actually do to really demonstrate um, their commitment to the climate agenda. Um, I think particularly when it comes to um, proving that moving to 100% renewables is actually a better way of mitigating the risks around your business. Um, we did some modelling a couple of years ago here in BT where we look at the fact that we use about 1% of, uh, of electricity that's generated in the UK to, to power the network. Um, and with energy prices going you know, just, just following the, the, the trend, we were looking at a situation where the, our energy bill was going to double, if not treble, over the over the you know the medium term. So we we mitigated that risk by making some very significant uh, investments in, in renewable energy um, and have done a range of of, of, of different uh, uh, solutions. Um, but really, have um, uh, been on 100% renewable power in the UK since 2010. Um, so by joining the RE100, we are actually just uh, adding our voice to many of the other business voices who are all you know saying that the science is clear the business case is proven uh, and by demonstrating that commitment you know we're signing up to the RE100. So that's a very important thing that you're doing as a company uh, you've also got this three to one ambition this other initiative where you're actually looking to use your customers to help drive further emissions reductions. Yeah I mean you can do, you know, the, 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 the stuff that makes sense commercially and, and you can do the quick wins. But actually, if you're fascinated with leadership and what do you really need to do to demonstrate uh, leadership as an organization. And for us, you know, we've we've moved this agenda from being one of our you know, strategic focuses to actually being the purpose of the company. So we now, you know, and Gavin, our CEO, talks about, you know, using the power of communications to make a better world and is constantly challenging us as we make some of the biggest decisions around how we allocate capital to say, how is this really reflective of the purpose of the company? Um, so, so really, um, um, we didn't want to just stop at our own operations uh, in terms of taking that cost out and mitigating that risk, but actually bringing the supply chain with us on the one hand, so working with some of the biggest, you know, ICT suppliers in the world to to also um, not so much uh, run the same old approach of having an audit based uh, stick you know that that we'd kind of um, terrify our suppliers with but actually have more of a carrot based approach so we, we launched the better future supplier forum which is about rewarding excellence and in innovation for you know companies that were taking uh, carbon out of our supply chain because then of course we can pass that value through to our customer so when we look at the overall impact of our of our carbon emissions the customer element is about 20 times the size of, of our own operations. So that's where the biggest impact is, but it's also where the biggest opportunity is. You know, so we have a portfolio of about 3.2 billion pounds, which is abating more carbon than BT and our entire supply chain produces in any given year. And the, the net good goal specifically is about really growing that portfolio and getting to a three to one ratio by the year 2020, which means that we're in a position to be able to say that we want to grow BT by abating carbon, um, but have a full value chain approach to actually doing that. And the methodology, the net good methodology that we, we are using, we've open sourced that. So anybody can use that. And really we see that as being part of how, you know, businesses should be leading on, you know, some of these zero sum games that basically affect us all. Now, that's an awful lot that you're trying to achieve there. And I'm sure it isn't easy. What are some of the challenges that you've come up against in this journey and, and how are you addressing them? Well, first things, hire great people. So all my team are much better than me at this stuff. So that's one of the things. I think the second thing is um, after you run out, there's a lot of quick wins. There's a lot of things that you will kind of find out there that's just, it just never made sense that the lights were left turned on, that the water pipe was leaking, that, you know, when you've cleaned up all of those quick wins and actually aggregated all of that value to, together, uh, um, I think then you get into a situation where you're having conversations with your finance community about making investments that are probably around different time horizons than they are typically used to seeing returns within. So, you know, our CFO would have, you know, a few years 
years ago looked to see uh, returns you know, within a three-year time frame. And they were the type of business cases that were getting through our, our design council, which is you know, how we control about 2.3 billion in capital expenditure in any given year. But uh, um, as you kind of look at how the climate agenda and a lot of the risks and the externalities that come with that were affecting you know, our portfolio, our network, you need to make decisions in a different time horizon more a medium term to a long term time frame so we we had a you know a um, you know a kind of a, a series of scenarios you know which we were able to bring our CFO through um, and really that was you know um, um, the logic that you know kind of saw him sign off on close to about a billion pounds uh, in, in business cases in renewable um, solutions over the last couple of years and you were talking a little bit before about the role of technology and presumably with you know the advances in digital media platforms in particular there are all sorts of new opportunities to engage consumers and the whole supply chain in, in a really impactful way well you say supply chain there i actually think that the most exciting space at the moment is how digital technology is going to show up on the demand side because i think that you know the rise of the sharing economy is an amazing example of how when the world becomes more networked we immediately get Get the ability to just leverage and share resource and there's so much value being created by new Ubers, new zip cars, new Yurdles, you know, Adam Werbach's initiative. There seems to be another one of those, you know, um, sharing economy um, and businesses being floated almost on a, on a weekly basis. And that's just the sharing economy. I think then when you look at how connectivity is, is, is going to create, um, you know, the connected home or the connected car, I think what you get into is a really exciting set of strategic opportunities for businesses like us to look at how we can ultimately, by creating a more connected world, uh, we can facilitate a more decentralised energy system where people who used to be um, consumers of energy now with uh, Tesla Powerwall in their home and solar on the roof are actually um, suppliers of energy and they can use digital technology to say how much of that electricity they want to keep for their own use, how much of that they want to trade to the market or to their, to their neighbour if they're part of a co-op. Um, and they can kind of be part of that overall experience and, and ultimately that creates massive disruption um, within the, you know, within the, uh, the, the you know, the, um, uh, the way we are providing that utility, um, which is quite concerning if you're, you know, one of the big six utilities here in this, in this, in this country. Um, but then you look at how, you know, like the connected car, how disruptive uh, that is going to be from a transportation perspective by having um, ultimately everything being a device. So a traffic light is a device, a building is a device a car as a device, if they're all talking to each other in a much more autonomous fashion, your ability to alleviate congestion, you know, in big, um, you know, cities that are popping up almost on a monthly basis in places like China, um, it's it's just uh, mind boggling how much, uh, you know, how much uh, value there is to be created really on the back of digital technology on, on the demand side. We did some work with uh, the Global East Sustainability Initiative and Accenture, and we identified that there's about six trillion in new revenue opportunities uh, to to be created between now and 2030 on the back of this type of disruption and and even you know, kind of more, I guess, uh, compellingly is is five trillion uh, in in efficiency savings across you know some of the biggest businesses in the world by you know being being more connected than they are uh, today. Well, potentially some really interesting and exciting stuff there, and obviously great opportunities for businesses like yours. Um, this is a really key year for climate, and we're going to see the Paris summit at the end of the year. Um, you know, based on what you were saying there, what do you think companies should be doing to to help inform and engage the negotiators, and I guess help them to come to a really strong and ambitious outcome, the one that we all need at the end of the yeah. day. Well, I think the first thing is leverage the power of your brand. So, you know, all the big businesses in the world will have their own strengths and ways that their brand actually show up in the world. For some, you know, their brands are very focused on, um, you know, uh, utilities like like water or, you know, other, um, um, you know, aspects that are very connected to the climate agenda. For us, we've made massive investments uh, in the world of sport, um, in addition to actually our big digital inclusion investments, you know. so. By us making that investment, we asked ourselves the question, you know, how, how can the world of sport actually show up on the climate agenda in a way that's much more disruptive and also capable of bringing this agenda out of, um, you know, if you don't mind me saying, you know, the, the climate group 
territory, you know, people who I think are, are converted, you know, and, and believers, um, um, to those who are maybe football fans, maybe people who watch the Super Bowl, people who watch ice hockey. Um, but, you know, if we don't fix climate, there will be no sport. We've not yet managed to find a way of actually relaying that message to sporting audiences that they get. Firstly, their own power. So with 600 million people, if you can believe this, following Liverpool Football Club, um, what if 10% of them all switched uh, to a renewable energy provider? You know, that the power of these fans and the numbers that you're dealing with there, I think could be truly transformational. Um, and you're seeing, you know, the, the Pontifex of Pope uh, showing up on, on climate and uh, inclusive growth as well. <clears throat> but from a BT perspective, by leveraging the power of our brand, which is uniquely configured really around sport being um, um, a kind of a real power powerful platform for social change. We are very invested in how that can be used to mobilise new constituents on the climate agenda. So then how do you transform that energy, that sort of engagement with consumers particularly, and use that to drive in even greater ambition by the policy makers? Well, I think bottom-up pressure is the key because I think, you know, the policy makers can see a clear divide between businesses who are going to be left with stranded assets ultimately in the end of, at the end of the day and are going to have a lot of, you know, value destroyed within their own organisations and they're not able to innovate their way out of that. And then there is the, the businesses who will profit hugely on the back of being able to resolve and identify these issues and be agile and, and collaborate and, and think strategically and deal with them. So I think policy makers are hopefully through initiatives like We Mean Business and other you know initiatives through WEF and WBCSD and yourselves actually hearing a kind of a very unified voice around the business cases clear. You know, for us, we need no convincing. Um, and hopefully that voice is starting to drown out a lot of the, you know, the denial um, you know who are who are clearly on the other side of the fence but uh, you know I think that moving you know moving um, um, beyond just to having our uh, direct lobbying influence I think that bottom-up pressure our brands are all capable of creating that type of bottom-up pressure if we take our egos off the table so I think you know if you look at 1.8 billion Millennials on the planet um, they are all very purposeful very values led they feel very disconnected from the political system um, they buy into brands, but they will really challenge their integrity if they don't think they are standing up to their claims and they're very capable consumer activists, particularly in the in the online space. So if we can um, really mobilise that constituents to through initiatives like collectively.org, which is a collaboration of some 50 of the biggest brands in the world who've all accepted, we're going to take our brands off the table. We're going to inspire young people about what they can actually do, how they can make a difference um, um, and just show them how all of these small actions add up into a massive uh, contribution, um, particularly when it comes to lending um, you know, a unified voice of young people into the, the whole UN process. Because I think what a CEO sees, um, you know, if he's not convinced, um, is, is you know, the customers of the future ultimately voting, you know, voting with, their, with their feet um, and saying, look, if your brand is not uh, you know, dealing with the climate agenda, we will not only we're not going to buy from you, we're not going to work for you. You. you know, and we're seeing organisations like Unilever and others who are really committed to this agenda starting to show up as, you know, the number three most sought after brand in LinkedIn because young people really want to work, you know, for an employer like Unilever who's really been committed to this and showing the way for, you know, a, a number of years now. So I think, you know, that bottom up pressure on the system can come in a lot of ways. I think collectively is an amazing example of, of brands collaborating in the face of the consumer to create that type of, type of activation, that type of pressure. Um, um, I think we were good at doing that on the supply side, but have not yet really deployed that on the demand side as effectively as, as collectively is doing it right now. Um, so, so I guess, you know, if there's an ask in this, you know, any CEO out there watching this, you know, you should be joining collectively, um, you know, um, particularly if, you know, if you, if you agree to take your ego off the table and help, you know, mobilise young people. Well, I think we're going to leave it there on that very <laughs> upbeat note. Uh, thank you very much, Neil sure. Dunn. I uh, was speaking there to Neil Dunn, the Chief Sustainability Officer at the BT Group. That's all we've got time for today from the Climate Group. Here at Climate TV, thank you very much. See you next time. Bye-bye.